I believe everyone should have joined. So welcome everybody. Today we have a very exciting panel. A couple of these people I have actually, a couple of these ladies I have actually attended classes with. So I'm excited to see some of you. It's been a long time. Um, I appreciate everyone joining and happy Women's Month. I can't believe it's already March. So our March last year looked very different. Anyways, without further ado, I want to just get started. We have a lot of questions and a, a good amount of panelists to get through. So um, today we're celebrating Women's History Month. Um, we, as you saw in some of the emails, we called it Her Story, um, since we are highlighting the women of ICS. We want to showcase the women and their superstars and their journey. And they're comprised of, from all walks of life in this journey. They have worked in different corporations, uh, and we want to talk about not only their journeys, but also have a conversation about, you know, what their, um, uh, how to make changes in equality for women. And we welcome comments and dialogue in the chat room, but we will address them at the end. So we will first begin with Renee. And Renee, do you want to share a little bit about your journey when you graduated, what other degrees you may have, your career path, and your job today? Sure. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening, wherever you all are tuning in from. I am Renee Reed. Um, I am a 2019 graduate of the Masters of Com Human Computer Interaction and Design program. Um, and I'm currently a staff UX design researcher at LinkedIn. Um, I won't assume that everyone knows what that is. So I get to research and design the mobile and web develop or the website um, application for the LinkedIn site, specifically around your profile. So that's where I do a lot of my work. Um, my undergrad degree is actually um, from a historically black college and university in uh, Savannah, Georgia, so a, a HBCU. And um, uh, I actually started my master's way into my career, which was really great. Um, after I graduated, I started and I was 20 years into my career. Uh, before I got my master's. So what was great about that, I was able to apply a lot of what um, I was learning in my uh, grad school program to real day uh, stuff at LinkedIn. So it also helped me out in terms of not going into debt because I was able to pay off uh, grad school a lot easier because I was already into a, a career. So that was fantastic. Um, and so, yeah, I know we'll get into this a little bit later, but my journey uh, to grad school through my professional career um, has been every a lot of zigzags, a lot of twists and turns, but all for the greater good of landing in this amazing industry of user experience, where I've actually been able to utilize a lot of the skill sets that I have learned and acquired throughout my career journey as a project manager, as a salesperson, as someone who was in customer success and client success. Um, so pulling that all together, acquiring all of these skills and becoming the uh, UX researcher that I am today. Um, and so, yeah, my journey uh, landed me at uh, UC Irvine. And what was great about that was I was able to uh, do my program while I was working. And that was the main attraction for me. It was a hybrid of in-person and online um, and something that I needed in my career. So happy to be here um, and I will pass it to the next person. Uh, Renee, just quick, quickly. Um, so the degree you got is actually the new program that UCI started, right? Yes, so I'm the newer of the bunch as you look at everyone's, uh, when everyone's graduated. Um, so I am cohort three of that program. Um, that was ran by Dr. Jillian Hayes, who is fantastic. I don't know if she's on. Hello, Jillian. Um, so yeah, cohort three, the best cohort, of course. <laughs> um, we were a vibrant, spirited bunch, really eager. And what was great about that as well is that there were people who were fresh out of their undergrad programs 
And then there were also people who were like myself who were in industry. So um, a great kind of, uh, like I said, mix of students. So we were able to learn from one another and teach one another um, as well. So yeah, great program. Yeah, we um, have highlighted the masters, the more professional masters in our November Lunch and Learn. Uh, but I think it's somewhat new and so not everyone's familiar. So, you know, if people have questions, they could probably private message you and it is on our YouTube channel so people can get more information. So next we will have Rosalva. So I heard her speak right before the pandemic at uh, Discovery Cube uh, at the Hall of Fame event and we she has a very interesting story and she actually has set up a scholarship at UCI ICS and we actually even have one of her recipients um, Adriana on the call so it's a very kind of full circle and we will have Rosalva talk about her background and journey. Thank you so much. Uh, well, it, it, is it possible for me to share uh, yeah. my yeah. screen? Well, first, I would like to thank you for inviting me to, to this event. I am very honored and happy to to be here with all of you and also alongside this incredible uh, woman. So um, I am originally from, from Peru, from Lima, and I would like to share my, my story that it's a, a story and my tech journey of many making possible the impossible. That's how I like to, I like to say it. And yeah, I see now I can share my screen. I will go ahead and share my screen. And I'm originally from, uh, from Peru, and that's where I studied my uh, degree on informatics engineering, or the equivalent of um, computer, computer science. I, I work in Peru for five years uh, as a software engineer creating software for the university and also for telecommunication companies and banks. That's where my passion for doing research started. I wanted to understand how we can improve the software development process. And that's when I decided to uh, look for opportunities where I can do that research. I decided to pursue PhD programs in the US. Uh, at that point, it was a big challenge for me because I my knowledge of English was very basic. So I quit my job and for six months and three months I prepared for the TOEFL and three months for the GRE and after I passed those I applied. Uh, at many times when I applied for, for, for fellowships and to um, programs being in, in Peru people will tell me like why are you doing that like you have you haven't been there like you will not get admitted but I, I always think like what's the worst thing that could happen right I learned in the process so it was a big, uh, like I was super happy when I was uh, offered by UCI to complete the, the PhD program in uh, information and computer science with an emphasis on software engineering. And at that point, I decided to live my whole life uh, and pack all that into suitcases and come to the, to the US for the PhD program. I completed the, the program, the master and also the PhD in ICS. And at, at the end of the at the end of the program, I I brought one book and edited one book in English, which for me was like at that point something that I thought it could be uh, impossible. But again, um, it it also helped me a lot my education at UCI uh, to grow as a person, to learn about different uh, cultures, about collaboration in a multidisciplinary environment, and I am very grateful because it opened so many doors for me. A, one of those being um, Intel. I received an offer from Intel after I completed my PhD. I worked there as a, as a, as a software quality analyst initially, and then as a, as a program manager. And, and I have always been looking for the, the community. We are not many uh, Latinos and Latinas in, in technology. So I, I was part of the Latinos uh, leadership at Intel and also uh, the, the woman at uh, but I didn't find many, many Peruvians. So I decided to, to, to create a nonprofit that is called Peru SB, that it's, it aims to close the technology and innovation gap between Peru and Silicon Valley. And we have these annual uh, meetings that are called Tech Suyo. Tech, it's English for technology. Suyo, it's the, 
Uh, it means task in Quechua, that is the native Peruvian language from the Incas. And our goal and what we do every year is we have meetings in the US, in Berkeley, uh, in UC Berkeley, at MIT, and the same in Peru. And our goal is to share that knowledge uh, with, the, with the community so they can innovate at, at the fastest pace because it takes like 14 years in average for the technology to arrive to other places in the world and also to motivate other um, students, the next generation of Latinx uh, students. And now, and uh, since four years ago, I, I work at, at Google as a software program manager. I have been working on uh, cloud security and privacy, and also um, in, with our top partners for Android and Play, and, and now I'm working on Google Shopping as well. As well. So, you can see here all the all the images or or things that uh, went very well. Behind all this, it's a lot of effort, a lot of hard work, a lot of um, a, a lot of endurance and perseverance to to achieve this. And this is all that has made me the fearless Latina leader that we are today. We are only two percent of the of the workforce Latinas and in some companies even less than that because there is no actual representation of the real world so in some cases we are like 0 0.x percent so it's not very common to see um, other women and Latinas in technology so my uh, my family and my father especially taught me like if there is no that you can change the world from wherever you are and even a small step it's a step forward so my, uh, I, I decided to give that small step by creating the um, a graduate award in ICS, and this was to establish in 2019 with the UCI Foundation to to celebrate my Latinx uh, heritage and also to to support graduate students in need, and and this is my way to give back to the university at UCI that has opened so many doors for me, and that's what I wanted to share with you today. Thank you. That is a great story. It's, your hard work and perseverance has definitely paid off. So again, thank you for sharing that. Uh, Jola, uh, we, you're up next. Please tell us about your background. I have not actually met Jola ever in person, but she's been part of Wix, which was Women in Computer Science, which me and many of the panelists have been part of. So that's actually, I just blindly reached out to her and I appreciate you being here. So please share your journey with us. Hey y'all, my name is Jola Bolaji. Um, I graduated from UC Irvine with a degree in ICS and a specialization in human computer interaction in 2013. Um, so I did my bachelor's there. I actually started off um, as a straight computer science major and I took a course by Melissa Masmanian um, that really kind of piqued my interest in HCI and kind of this idea of like tech plus, um, tech plus people, tech plus ethics, tech plus other things. Um, and so I switched my major into that um, and dove head first into that, really enjoyed it. Um, then decided why not just, you know, take a little bit more school. Um, and after talking with Judith Olson, um, she and her husband had come from the University of Michigan School of Information um, before they were at Irvine. And she said, I think you'd really like Michigan as a graduate school. So I went to Michigan where it was very, very cold, um, but I got my master's in human computer interaction there as well. Um, after that, I actually did a short stint um, at Disney. Um, I was uh, funnily enough working in their games user research lab there um, because I really wanted to be um, in the game space. Um, and so I took the job there um, trying to get into games user research, but I actually took um, a position as a product manager thinking I could, you know, move sideways once I got there. Um, but I actually really fell in love with um, product management um, and just the day-to-day -day impact on the game, right? So what I do as a product manager is a lot of live ops. So it's, you know, setting the cadence of events and sales in the game, tracking key performance metrics like revenue and retention rate of players and things. Um, and while I liked research a lot because I got to like work with people, I really liked the immediate impact that I had as a product manager. Um, so when I left Disney, I actually went to a small indie game dev studio um, here in Burbank called TikTok Games. Um, unfortunate that they have that app that the kids use that everyone now thinks, but it's not that. It's a different game studio that existed before. 
Um, yeah, and so I was actually the uh, first in-house product manager they'd ever hired. They had never had one. It was a very small studio when I joined. Um, and so now we've grown to a team of four product managers, including myself. Um, and the studio has like a lot more titles that we run. Um, we currently have a game that we're doing with Funko Pop, which are these, you know, little collectible dolls that people use. And it's really exciting because we've got, you know, thousands of people playing that game. It's a million dollar game. Um, so it's a lot of big impact. And, you know, I manage that every single day to day, the little things there. Um, and so a lot of it is kind of combining the technological side because, you know, I have to work with programmers every single day. Um, also, there was a lot of kind of organizational and team aspects um, that I learned in the program, especially under Judith Olson that I use uh, day to day. Um, and also a lot of what I did in Wix, um, one of the reasons why I work at the company I work at now is because we are kind of a unicorn where you see representation of uh, uh, diversity of gender, diversity of race, diversity kind of, of all walks of life. Um, and it really just, I feel like makes our environment that much better when you have so many different life experiences. Um, and so people are like, why do you say that small company when you can go to a, you know, like a larger place, especially with the experiences that you have. Um, and so I definitely want to try and uh, emulate what I want to see. And so work in that and grow that um, in all the ways that I can. And I'm glad to be here today. So thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Jola. We actually did have the Olson speak about a few months ago about COVID and Zoom meetings and where that was going. So that's a great tie in also of the small world. Uh, next up, uh, quick question, Jola. Are you actually into gaming also? Um, not super heavily actually, which is a funny thing. I got into gaming um, back in the age of like Facebook games and mobile games. That's why I specialize in mobile games. Being in the gaming industry, I now own the PlayStation and I play PC games with my coworkers, but I was never actually a huge gamer as a child. Oh, yeah, interesting. I, I, I'm sure that's just a different topic, but it's interesting to see the, the, the stark difference of how many males are gamers versus maybe females. So but, Yeah, it's definitely interesting too, topic. the amount of people who are uh, not gamers who work in games. I think people get afraid that if they're not hardcore gamers, they can't work in games. Right, right. So a different, uh, maybe an another lunch and learn about gaming and women and how that impacts. Uh, so the next speaker we have is Casey. I have known Casey for probably two decades now without aging myself too much. We actually started out working together as interns at Canon. Yeah, so in our, my I, last year. Excuse me? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, uh, and we've kept in touch ever since. So um, I will have her tell her journey and her story to us. Go ahead, Casey. Yeah, well, I graduated with an information computer science degree in 2001, and I think I had a, kind of an unconventional journey to get there in that I applied to UC Irvine as a drama major. And I had uh, singing and piano and music lessons as a child, and I loved musical theater, and I thought I was going to be a star on Broadway. And then right before orientation, I came to my senses and realized that I would make a terrible waitress and I needed to pick another major. And so I ended up in computer science by almost a process of elimination. Uh, the music lessons gave me an aptitude for math and it was the only math science related thing that I thought I might actually want to do for a career. And I just got lucky that I was good at it once I actually, you know, got into it. So I'm very thankful for that. And right after I graduated, well, let me go back. I did add back drama later. I found that I did miss the arts. So I graduated, dropped double major. Um, I use my degree in the arts more than people might realize in kind of a subtle way. So I, I don't regret taking the effort to get two degrees in that it's very useful. Uh, speaking up in a meeting isn't that big a deal once you've performed in front of thousands of people kind of thing. So almost right after college, after I left that internship I did with Pooja, um, I was working for a small startup and they got a contract with the Navy 
to do some software development for them for the Naval Facilities Engineering Command. And I wasn't supposed to be on that contract, but the person they hired left. And so off I went to the Navy. And now I'm on my third employer with the exact same role. Well, up until about six weeks ago, actually, it's now different. I'm now working for NAVC on a similar project instead of software about the buildings that the Navy owns now. It's almost identical software, but it's about the actual boats now. So I have secret clearance. That's cool. Um, yeah, so I've been there ever since. That's my story. Nice. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Arlene, you are up next. Please tell us a little bit about your journey. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yes. Hi. My journey, I came to decide to attend UC Irvine because I grew up in San Diego. Um, I'm a daughter of immigrants, first one born here, um, the first one to graduate from an American university. So it's kind of a big deal that I make something of myself. <laughs> but um, I came to UC Irvine because I wanted, I grew up in San Diego and wanted to get out of my parents' house, but didn't want to move too far away because, you know, I still, you know, want, had ties there with my friends. And so that's how I came to decide on UC Irvine, which was great. I lived in the dorms and Rosalva, I actually met um, two friends who are of Peruvian descent. So when you mentioned being from Lima, I was like, oh, yes, <laughs> love Peruvian food. Um, and I started off as a poli sci major. Uh, I took some community college courses and even US history, AP US history in high school. So I started off poli sci and basically pretty much was on academic probation after maybe a couple semester, a couple quarters. One of the requirements in poli sci was ICS 1A. And once I took ICS 1A, I was like, wow, this is where I need to be. I took, a t um, I took pro programming classes in junior high and high school. I had an Atari growing up, so I was a baby gamer, I guess you can say back then. And it just kind of clicked for me that this is what was, you know, what came easy for me. And so even though I still wasn't a star student in ICS, that was kind of where I found my niche. And I made great friends. I actually have a couple on the call today. So thank you for joining. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much my journey. And right off the bat, after graduating, I took a job at UC Irvine, working in the Department of Psychiatry and Human Behavior as kind of like their on-site IT help desk person. And I realized right away that I did not like crawling under desks, <laughs> plugging in. <laughs> plugging in printers and connecting drives and doing saves, I realized really quickly that that's not what I wanted to do. Shortly after that, I found a programming job also at UC Irvine in the Office of Financial Aid. Um, started off programming COBOL, did not study that, but got to learn it on the job. So that was really cool. Shortly after that, um, you know, Microsoft was really big. They started their BI um, tools. So that's where I learned reporting services. Also on the job, that was in a real estate um, type of company. And that was just before the bubble popped. So um, got laid off from there, and but got into you know banking industry, finance industry, and somehow I ended up in the mechanical, um, biomechanical device industry. So that's where I'm at now, Oster Americas. We make prosthetic, feet and knees, as well as like orthopedic products. So wrist braces, neck braces, back braces. And my department is called sales operations. We're basically the liaison between IT and, you know, the sales, um, sales reps that sell our product. And I've been there for, I think, 13 years now. And the company and the sales, uh, sales organization has evolved so much that it, you know, 
it's constantly evolving. And basically that's probably why I've stayed there for so long. Um, it also helps that my boss is female. So she's very supportive and understanding. Um, so yeah, we get along great and it's been, it's been a good journey so far. <laughs> nice. That must be very gratifying to work for a company like that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Boss obviously makes a great difference. And then also in the work you do. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So, thank you, so thank much. you. And our last, uh, last but not least, we have Yasi. Uh, she is actually in my graduating year. And I haven't seen her in a while, but we're Facebook friends and stuff. So I'm glad to have her on board. So Yasi, please share your story with us. Thanks, Pooja. I get to see a lot of familiar faces on here. It's taken me back. Um, yeah, so I graduated in 2002 with uh, my bachelor's in ICS with a specialty in information systems. Um, and, uh, you know, later on went to go get my uh, executive MBA from, from Pepperdine, uh, several years later, not until about 2007, eight, uh, perfect timing for when that recession hit. Um, but yeah, so I, um, while I was at UCI, uh, getting, getting my, uh, ICS degree, I, uh, was looking for internships like crazy. I, and I was willing to do anything for free and I couldn't find anything until finally I was working at a bank and um, ha so happened that the guy that used to come to my teller window every, every Saturday, uh, was an engineer and was working for a startup in orange and, uh, you know, said, Hey, why don't you come in for, for a job interview for, for an internship? And, you know, I ended up getting it, which was, which was awesome. Um, and they actually paid me, which was great. And, uh, and I started all the way at the bottom, right? So I started answering phones and then I kind of went into the tech support side of things and I was still, you know, getting my degree. Um, and similar, similar to Ar Arlene, I was a, a poli sci major to start, I uh, thought I was going to go to law school and, and I was just bored out of my mind reading and regurgitating stuff. So I wanted to do something that was a little bit more challenging. And, um, you know, the, the computer science field never really came real, real natural to me. So it was, it was challenging and it was hard, but it was uh, really rewarding. And it was interesting because, you know, I used to walk through the, through the campus of, of uh, UCI and, um, you know, sometimes you'd get people asking you what your major were, what major was, or they just assumed that you were like a social science major or something that you couldn't be anything in computer science or engineering. And that kind of just challenged me and pushed me more that even if this wasn't, you know, uh, what I was great at, I was going to, I was going to push myself and I was damn sure going to be great at it in, in some way, shape or form. Um, so I kind of just worked my way up through, through that startup, which actually happened to be a really male dominated field. Um, it was tech for the waste industry. So I was one of probably, I don't, I can't even tell you it, it, it's, it was like a 1% women in that field at that time. It was ridiculous. I used to get called little girl. I didn't know what I was talking about. Um, and it was fun. It challenged me. It pushed me. And, you know, I had to have a really, really thick skin um, to be in that male dominated world. And I was in that space for almost 18 years. Um, and uh, within that space, uh, several years ago, actually, I, I was a recipient of a 40 under 40 award for the waste industry, which was really gratifying for me, especially, again, being one of very few women in that group. Um, and in the industry in general. And then I moved on to another male dominated industry where I am today, um, a uh, publicly traded company in New Zealand and in Australia on the stock exchange there called E-Road and it's a telematics company. So we deal with trucking companies and technology within vehicles um, and back office software and things like that. So um, I've been there for a few years now. I'm the vice president of operations there. Um, so I basically manage everything post sales, everything from tech support, customer success, customer service, uh, project management, onboarding and implementation, our supply chain and fulfillment teams and, and much more. So it's a really big team, but I'm, I'm really happy to be there. Um, but again, really, really male dominated industry. Uh, lucky that, that my organization is, um, is very inclusive of gender and, and race and everything like that. And they really actually try to push to hire um, more women in the tech field. And so when you go into our headquarters in New Zealand, it's, it's actually a really beautiful thing to see so many women engineers um, in that space. And even though I'm not doing any coding or anything like that, 
uh, I was able to take my, my degree and put it to use with the technical aspect and then the business aspect and really do something that I, that I love every day. Um, so yeah, so that's my story. Amazing. That's, you know, very strong to be in such a heavily male dominated field, right? And especially in this trash and waste field. So uh, we've, uh, we've talked about this a little bit, but I'll just open it up in case you wanted to add extra comments about it. What kind of made you choose ICS or what excites you about it currently? Um, so we can go in the same order, Renee, if you want to add anything more. Um, and after this question, we'll talk a little bit more about having this dialogue of where is gender equality, how have other women helped, and how being in a specific workforce um, can either help propel your career or not. But for now, I guess let's talk about, you know, what, what excites you about ICS. Yeah, um, I think, again, I, I mentioned this earlier in terms of the program that UC Irvine was offering was really attractive to me in terms of having that capability of uh, being in person, being online, um, specifically around HCI and design. I wanted to make sure that I was adding that um, academic uh, rigor to the work that I was already doing in industry. And had come up in industry, learned so much, had all of these skills and methodologies. Um, and of course, there's some amazing programs um, that are being offered in the HCI space um, from different universities. Some you have to go full time and be on campus. Um, and so, you know, in really investigating and researching all the different programs. Um, what really stood out for me for the master in HCI and design um, was this ability to uh, have um, uh, really industry uh, focus as well as, again, academic rigor and have that balance so that I can make it really applicable to what I was doing in my day to day. And as a UX researcher, um, I had you know, market research experience in the past for my undergrad. And this was just a really great way to complement um, all of the industry information and knowledge that I already had. And so this added just this uh, amazing layer uh, to, my, uh, to my resume, to my portfolio of skill sets um, to really let me stand out. And like I said, what it was really great for me is that I waited 20 years into my career journey to go back for my master's. And in doing so, I was really laser focused yeah. on what I wanted. Um, so that added to like, I just wasn't just doing something like flippantly. This was something like I was already in the industry and I can pick up and utilize everything I was using. So really beneficial. So I, I have a more of a Six Sigma background. And so in my day-to-day -day life, anywhere I go, I see inefficiency. When you're um, looking at things, do you see design flaws at almost everything you look at? Or? It's one of those things like the scales are taken off your eyes and you will never look at the world the right. same again, like yeah. never. <laughs> um, and so, like I said, adding like the, uh, like the psychology, um, the cognitive science on top of the technical skills and things like that. It's just a whole new world. Like I cannot go anywhere without talking about a user experience. An <laughs> elevator, the minute I get in the elevator, I'm just like, oh my gosh, the buttons are all wrong. No one knows what this is. Like everything is a user experience and I'm always dissecting the, the human computer interaction. So, right. yeah. And without getting too far off topic, uh, I, I don't know if you're familiar with all those new elevators where you have to press the button like on a certain level and then you're like kind of stuck. And I'm like, who designed this? I thought this was a good yeah. idea. And also the, those elevators with the accessibility and things like that are a nightmare as well, where you do everything on like one floor and then you go yes. in and then you're yes. just kind of like, okay, what's happening now? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so much to talk about there. In, right? yeah. uh, so Rosalva, uh, do you want to add anything more about what makes you so excited about ICS or passionate, um, why you chose it? Yes, yes, I would like to add a couple of things on why I chose uh, UCI and ICS specifically. It was because of the multidisciplinary nature of the, of the program. I, I remember reading about that, but actually when I started my, the PhD program, I was very 
and I'm happily surprised that my other PhD peers in my lab, I was, I was a uh, software engineer, but they were uh, anthropologists. And another person, my advisor was like, a, had a, C, a major in CS and also psychology. So at the, at the beginning, it was uh, like a really good learning, right? Experience to see how you can see the same problem from multiple perspectives and understand like why they were thinking that way. And that was eye-opening for me. At that point, I learned a lot and it has helped me a lot now because like as a program manager, uh, I need to interact with multiple roles like security engineers, privacy engineers, and but at the same time with lawyers and, and, and others. So it's always good to have this perspective and also having always the user in mind and having this perspective of like other people and welcoming like what is the how other people might see the problem and not actually also not only always jumping into a solution but thinking about is this the right problem to solve because we could sometimes spend lots of time solving the problem but it's not a, the right problem uh, to solve so the multidisciplinary aspect also the state of the art and research that it was conducted in the Institute of Software Research and all the professors and opportunities to interact with, um, with top uh, researchers in the, in the world with all the collaborations that we had, that, that was amazing. And we, what excites me the most about ICS now is I have seen how quickly it has adapted to the, to the new normal and having these virtual classes and, and shifting a, like the curriculum and giving still opportunities for grad students to, to, to teach and to help, um, to help professors. So I have been amazed on the, the ability to adapt to, to ICS. And, and now that, than, than ever, like all the, the content and the, and the, the materials that you receive at ICS and, and all the computer science classes and the digital skills are so needed now that we are moving more <laughs> than ever to, to the digital world as we were before. So I, I see a huge opportunity and, and I can see how ICS is giving us the, the, the change agents that we need for the world right now. Yes, exactly. Thank you for that comment. Uh, we actually spoke a little bit about UCI and how going to college in our last panel that we had last month. And although many companies are shifting into not necessarily requiring a college degree, uh, the impact of actually going to college and the other classes and the collaboration with other students and teachers and professors was what people said was one of the most valuable skills, even though technically they could have learned a lot of stuff just on the computer, but it is just that inter interdisciplinary um, classes and exposure that really helps people. So that's a great point. Uh, Jola, uh, any comments of how you, you know, were inspired to be an ICS and what you still love about it? Um, yeah, I think what inspires me about ICS is really um, how it affects so many different fields, right? Um, one thing that I really love is I'm a product manager in games, but I know product managers in healthcare, I know product managers in finance. Um, and so there's a lot of similarities in what we have and what we do, right? We're like managing a product and trying to like optimize it so that it can be used by um, all of our users, but also provide, you know, success metrics for our clients. Um, but like in such different spaces and such different applications that our users are experiencing that. And I think that is something that's really interesting to me um, that can be applied in so many different ways. Um, and I kind of look forward um, to seeing how that changes as technology continues to shift and change, um, you know, ICS just moves right along with it. Um, and so I'm always trying to keep up with it and definitely excited about that. And also just excited to see ICS grow um, as a whole, uh, more and more people, more and more diversity in it. Um, I definitely think that will also affect how it shifts and changes as who's involved in it too. Um, I, and in a few minutes, we will actually start addressing some of those things of what we are each individually doing or as a whole community to propel women and how changes can occur. Uh, Casey, 
uh, what made you kind of, you talked about it a little bit. Uh, I know that you're in the Navy, so that's a little bit different than some of the other stuff you do in your private time. So maybe you want to talk about your little pony collection and how you use drama and, you know, getting not just being in the Navy field, but also other ways you've incorporated computer science. Uh, well, I am not actually in the military. I am a contractor and I have been the whole time. Um, oh gosh. Uh, well, I want to say that I, what excites me about computer science is getting to solve problems. I get so much job satisfaction about knowing that I made somebody's job easier. I made their day better. I created something from nothing and now something that took them hours maybe now takes them minutes. And I like that. That makes me really happy knowing that. Um, like I, I've, my employer keeps trying to push me into more of a leadership role. And I've said, no, I like software engineering. This provides me with daily joy, or maybe not daily, but often enough, <laughs> you know, so I said, I would do a tech lead role, but I don't want to be in management. I like programming. I like software engineering. I like the process. So that's just something about me where it just, it's my jam. Um, I, <laughs> I do have one of the world's largest collections of My Little Ponies. And that led me to, uh, on a volunteer basis, I did a side, uh, it's a side job. Um, I joined the staff for my little pony convention because I was kind of bored for a while. And I'm like, your guys' registration system needs help. Your website needs help. So I joined that staff and at comedy of errors, I ended up running the whole thing. So I, I've definitely had some surreal experiences I've fallen into just because I'm like, hey, your website needs some help. Let me help you. And then I end up on a stage at closing ceremonies of people asking for my autograph. It's very strange and surreal sometimes. Um, the Navy at least was stable, I'll give it that. Um, yeah, I think that's enough. Yeah, that's a nice story of how you've used ICS, you know, for your passions. And mm -hmm. every time I see a My Little Pony, I always think of you. So, uh, Arlene, uh, please tell us a little bit more about what you love about ICS. And Okay, one comment about My Little Pony. I totally had a castle, like a big castle. So, I mean, are there, can I sell that? <laughs> yes, yes, I have that. Um, well, I think it's amazing that when I was at UCI, um, the depart it was called a, the Department of ICS. And now I believe it's a, the School of ICS. So I just think that's amazing, that's amazing. And uh, it just excites me that there's so many people, um, you know, now when they hear, oh, UCI, ICS, like they just, you know, it causes them to pause. Like it, it definitely is on the map and that's exciting to me because I was, you know, I was there, I was part of it. I, you know, I can, I can talk about my experience there. So that's what excites me. <laughs> Nice. And then Yasi, um, any additional comments about ICS or what? Yeah. So, so I, I have a funny story of how I, I chose ICS. Um, I, I had no concept of anything, computer science, programming, nothing. And I was doing the political science route. And my brother's girlfriend at the time had just finished her ICS degree at UC Irvine. Um, and she got a job uh, before she even graduated with IBM making a ton of money. And I was like, oh, well, I can do that. And so I went to Saddleback College in Shun Viejo and took a Pascal programming language class. And um, I was like, I don't know what the heck this is. And it, it was a little hard for me because my mind did, just didn't think that way. And I kind of put the two together and I was like, well, poli sci, okay, read, regurgitate, memorize, computer science, that's hard. Okay, we'll go with the hard one. So I wanted to be challenged. And so that's why I picked it, which is, which is a funny story when I tell it because everyone thinks it's really weird, but um, no regrets at all to this day. And, and I think, you know, the thing that's super exciting to me about this degree, especially as it relates to just kind of my career and my, my journey 
since I graduated is that it's not just one thing, right? So a lot of people, and, and, and I think part of the reason why it can be intimidating to some people, and in particular, some women, is that, you know, when you think about ICS, you think it's just programming, and it's just not, right? Like, I knew going in that I was not a programmer. I tried it. I tried to do UX design. I tried it. I was like, yeah, it's not for me. It's just, it's, it's not, but I can take this. What I've learned here, and I can apply it to so many different things throughout a technology space. And it's what's helped me through my career, right? Having all the different roles that I had growing through my career, but also the degree and what I learned in school really helped me to kind of put it, put it into perspective that, look, I can take this tech background that I learned and yes, Maybe I wasn't the best programmer, but I understand the concept. So I can go sit and talk to a CTO. I can talk to an engineer and I can then apply that to a business and talk to a customer and put it in layman's terms where somebody can understand it, right? And I think that's kind of the most exciting thing. And I think one of the things that isn't brought to the surface a lot for people that are questioning whether they want to come into this field or not is that it's not just programming. It's not just coding. It's not just UI. They're so, it's such a broad range of just really cool things that you can take with this degree and apply it to so many different spaces. Yes, I agree with you that all these points have been very valid. And I wanted to now open this up a little bit and have a little bit more of a dialogue so anybody can speak up with some of these questions. One question would be, um, how have you overcome everyday, maybe subtle racism, um, or, and what are common misconceptions that people have about, you know, gender equality or inequality and how you kind of been mansplained in your workplace in a meeting specifically, any story or an, uh, anecdotes, um, and I'll just kind of open it up to any of the panelists to answer. So I'll, I'll share a story. Um, you know, I, again, having worked in, in male dominated fields my entire career, I've been mansplained a ton. Um, not, not so much anymore, but really early on in my career when, when I wasn't really sure how to handle it, you know, I, I guess, you know, age plays a factor. Sometimes if they look at you and think you're a little bit too young, it doesn't matter if you have a degree or not. Um, you know, and then being a woman on top of that is, can be challenging. And, um, sometimes the men that I've come across in my career early on in my career felt like I was inferior to them. Right. Um, and the way that I, the way that I approached it was very much like, okay, they're just ignorant. They have no clue. And I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Cause I know that I'm the expert here and I'm, I'm here to, let's say, implement a software solution for them. They have no idea what they're doing. Right. Um, I'm the one that's the expert here. And so what I did was I kept it very business-like, kept it very professional and, and kind of would make comments like, well, you know, one day you'll realize that, um, you know, that I'm going to be able to help you grow your business or how to implement this software. And you'll call me, don't worry, you'll call me. And, and sure enough, those people picked up the phone sometimes a year and a half later and said, I need your help, Yossi. Um, you were right. And, and that's kind of <laughs> the, the gratifying, that's the gratifying thing. It's like, see, I told you so, I told you so, but it's about having kind of, you know, you almost do have to develop a thicker skin and not take things so sensitively. And I, I have always been one to kind of take, take the fact that, that maybe I'm a different race, right. And I'm, I'm a different gender out of the equation and, and stop thinking that way that everyone's looking at me in that way and be very confident in, in my interactions with people and my knowledge. Right. I mean, your, your work, your experience and, and your knowledge and the way that you speak to people, that's what's going to prove to them that they're wrong about you and that they don't need to explain these things to you. So. Um, I'll share something. Um, one thing that when I was a student in computer science, um, Irvine actually had, I think I want to say it was like 12% women in ICS, which is like one of the highest in the UCs at, the, at that point when I was there. But one of the things I personally struggled with was everybody was walking around in a t-shirt and jeans and who I have been my entire life is someone who goes around in like dresses and big hair and earrings. And I was like, oh, I'm going to be taken seriously here. So I need to go get my like Steve Jobs black turtleneck and jeans every day so that people will think I'm like really in tech. Um, and Wix um, actually sponsored for me to go to uh, the Grace Hopper um, conference one year I think it was my junior or senior year and that was like amazing because it was literally like thousands of women in tech and just 
everyone who looked like everything, right? So there were people with like dyed hair, there were people in suits, there were people in dresses and just even just an experience like that, seeing so many women and so many women just being whoever they were really gave me a lot of confidence that I needed at that point. Um, and so I was like, you know what? I'm going to be in tech and I'm gonna be me. I'm not gonna change just so I can be accepted in tech. And um, that's also one of my favorite things about my current job um, is my boss is very much, um, I like to say an accomplice rather than an ally um, because we have gone into meetings, right? As a product manager, I'll go with him to meetings to potential customers and they will ask him product management questions when I'm sitting right there and was introduced as a product manager for the studio. And he'll turn to me like, he'll say, I actually have no idea. Joel, can you please explain this to them? And he will always redirect to me. And I love that because it really, bolsters my confidence and also like directly tells these people like hey you need to take this person seriously um not just whatever biases you may have against her for whatever reason so um definitely that's something that gives me a lot of hope that as we continue to interact with more people that we will change more people's perceptions so that we can really make an impact yeah i will i will also like to share and and add so for me, coming from a from a culture where machism it's the norm, sometimes it's it takes also relearning. Like for myself, it was a personal journey to to relearn what are the 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 accepted cultural cultural norms. And and something that that helped me a lot was to learn this concept of microaggressions. So those are the little things that could happen, like in in meetings or some comments that sometimes it's very small. But you are you, like, in my case, I was thinking like, is it me? Is it only me taking it that way? Or is it feeling the same for everybody? So that's something that for me, it was um, initially hard to process. And then when in some of those meetings, I, I saw other people, other women like saying, hey, no, that's not correct. Or not, that's not appropriate. And, and it helps me to learn, like to identify those, to, to identify those moments. And, and act immediately. Like when I see something like that uh, for, for me or for anybody else in the, in the room, I stand up like bravely immediately. And usually what it happens what, when I'm surprised is like, usually I will call up the behavior right there, uh, but then I will talk to the person privately and I be very specific on uh, I having these difficult conversations uh, format, like, okay, you said this, and then I, this make me feel this way. I will appreciate next time this will happen. And when I share that, the response I get is like, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean that. I didn't know that uh, some people will feel that way. I'm so sorry. So uh, the lesson I take is create awareness. Uh, some people don't, don't know like how others feel with that. So create awareness on that and, and, and believe on like, uh, good good intentions as well but at the same time like stand for yourself for others in the room and being brave yes yeah, so yeah. we actually discussed this microaggressions topic and word and how you know these biases and small small things then add up over time and that is part of the conversation of how to create change and I'm glad we have such strong women and you know powerful trailblazing women to discuss this and create some of these changes and have the open dialogue you know that's the most important thing I believe to create some of these changes is to have the dialogue. Renee do you want to add um, anything I know you have your um, head wrap line right? Yeah so um soon to come it's on its way but i i do clearly wear uh, a lot of head wraps and have just created a, a boldness about who i am and this authenticity and being able to show up in spaces that normally um historically in, in the professional and tech world you don't necessarily see um head wraps and so um, i've been very bold in in just being who i am in these spaces and what started out as something for me has literally what I've realized over my career has actually been the way that has freed up or given other people permission. And so I know someone put courage and was just mentioned about having, having courage and being brave. And when you are able to show up as your authentic self and operate uh, with that courage and bravery, 
you actually, without knowing sometimes, are freeing other people up to um, be bold and be brave in their own spaces as well. So um, it is important if you uh, have been given uh, that freedom yourself uh, to operate in that freedom and being able to speak up, um, confront those micro uh, microaggressions um, as best way as possible. Um, and I wanted to say that um, one of the things that was really, really helpful for me in my career when I did find those microaggressions starting to uh, fester over time, because they do build up, was uh, being able to use the phrase, this is how that showed up for me. And it creates this, because um, a lot of people feel like if you are confronting people, they're going to be defensive and things like that. But if you just approach it in a way of, I just want you to understand how this showed up for me. And, and to the point that was made earlier and that bringing that awareness is just so important um, so that the next person may not have to deal with it or may not have to experience it. So you're, you're helping yourself out and you're helping the next woman out uh, and things like that. So, yeah. Can I add something? That, that's a great comment, Renee. Um, you know, I when we were at UCI, uh, if you remember, we had we started a mentorship program for women um, to join ICS. Um, some of you may remember that. Um, and I, I think that's something super important that so many of us here can actually continue to do. So uh, when I moved to Portland, for example, I joined a group uh, for women in tech and I mentor three women um, because that's all I can manage currently. But it's super important, I think, because there's a lot of guidance that a lot of us can give based on our experience, whether it's through the tech space or through how to work with, with, you know, with men being a woman in the tech space and all that kind of stuff. And I think it's super important to kind of pay that forward and really, really help to guide some of these, these young women that are out there and struggling to find their space because they might feel pigeonholed or, or whatever it is. Um, and really use our experience and our knowledge and, and, and the experience of everyone here that we've heard to, to kind of help those women move forward. Yes, I agree, Yasi. Uh, another, you know, topic that has been brought up when we discuss microaggressions and stuff is this imposter syndrome. I don't know if any of you have dealt with that where you feel like, you know, you're trying to uh, show this feeling and you're second guessing yourself and how maybe you have overcome that. Can I speak on that? Yeah. Um, that is definitely true. Being in the room with, you know, the kind of technical guys who do it all day, they live and breathe some programming language or tech. Um, it's hard not to feel inferior in that kind of environment. And then I just remind myself that they have to Google the error message just as much as I do. They have to look it up just the same. They had to learn it somehow. <laughs> They're looking on Stack Overflow too. Uh, you look maybe at the usernames on there, who's asking the questions. It's not all women asking and men answering. That's not how it actually works in the real world. Um, they have to look it up too. So I just remind myself as well that the only difference between me and someone who can do something I can't is they've read different books than I have, or they've watched different videos than I have. They just have slightly different learning, but not necessarily a different capacity. So that helps a lot. Yeah, thank you, Casey. I wanted to be a little bit mindful of time. It is about one o'clock. Uh, there's a couple other questions, but uh, maybe we can address those a little bit after. I just wanted to have the audience, is there any takeaways that you each would like to, you know, point out about diversity and inclusion efforts um, in your personal or professional lives and anything that we as individuals can do to help foster this diversity and equality and inclusion? So um, how can we help combat these misconceptions and communicate more effectively? I want to say one thing really quick before we shift gears. Um, and I know this is probably an unpopular opinion when it comes to imposter syndrome. And I always bring this up when I hear it is that we also be, need to be mindful of systems that have been constructed to purposely make you feel that you are inferior. 
And so it may not even be imposter syndrome. We need to take inventory to understand, wait a minute, the system has got it set up in a way that I'm second guessing myself and it's not really me, it, it's the system. And so when we talk about um, marginalized communities and um, especially being a black woman myself, um, you know, there are just instances where you can point to where historically we have been made to feel a certain way. And so we need to realize that. And I also challenge a lot of women who say that they have imposter syndrome, recognizing that it is, a th it is something, that it does exist. But I also am mindful of the fact that people will carry something that isn't necessarily belonging to them. And I know it's just a word that is used constantly. And I also, I literally just, as a researcher, I'm always going to ask questions. I'll say, well, what is imposter syndrome? Can you, do you know what it is? Can you define it? And then when they start thinking about it, I was like, you know, it's one thing to have fear and, and, and have anxiety and be uncertain and that's okay. And we understand that, but that might not be imposter syndrome. So I challenge people to always uh, really take a step back and not uh, label themselves or diagnose themselves with something that may not even be what they're going through. And it, it changes how people perceive things. So. Yeah. Uh, other takeaways that anyone else would like to? Yeah, I would like to share also that uh, we, we need to be mindful to create a space for those uh, marginalized voices. And, and it could be a, a, um, like related with, with race, with culture, with, with anything, but we kind of start with small steps. And if in a, in a room, in a meeting, we see that there are people like who are not speaking, we, we didn't hear. From. It could be like personality introverts or anything like you never know, right? Like create that space for them uh, because sometimes it's it's hard for for some people. So creating that space helps, and 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 finding our own voice as as women because for many for many years we couldn't uh, share it. So let's find our voice and let's share it with the world. It's, it's time for us to be heard. Yeah, and I think you know. It, it, Traditionally, if you look back in history, you know, there's always been this battle between women um, in the workplace, right? It's always been kind of this cat fight thing. And um, I think one of the things that you see changing is women backing up women. Um, and and I, I think that's fantastic. And, you know, one of the things that, that we do, me and some of the executive team at my current company is as women, we sit down and we look within the organization to see kind of upcoming women rock stars in this space and see how we can help them foster and grow them to get them to where they want to be. Sometimes they don't want to be a manager, right? Um, sometimes they do. They have those aspirations. They're scared to share them or they're not sure if they can share it with their boss or if they're good enough or they doubt themselves. And I think it's just super important that we, that we help each other. We back each other up. Um, and that, you know, whether it's within your own organization or, you know, going outside and, you know, working with, with other women or even people within this forum, I think um, that's what's going to get us through it. Yes, if you have not started using or haven't used the mantra, empowered women, empower women, it has literally transformed a lot of people's way of thinking about if you are able to hold that space you are empowered, empower other women. So empowered women, empower women. I love it, love it. Yeah, empower her, Lily, correct. Uh, any other final questions? I just wanted to give a, do a little housekeeping and for whoever can stay on, there was a couple other questions we had. And if you have any questions, please post them in the chat if, if the audience has any questions also. One second. Uh, so I wanted to just put up this image and we can discuss this in a minute of, do you feel, you know, that you're juggling everything? Um, I'm not sure how many of you have kids, but between being a mom, being in the office, working out, also all the personal upkeep of beauty and everything that maybe men don't have to do. Um, do you feel like you're juggling everything? Uh, just a quick housekeeping. We have these lunch and learns every uh, Friday of first Friday of every month. 
And our website is at icsanteaters.org where you can get recordings of this and sign up to follow us on social media. And we will have some other events. So these are all our, how to follow us. And we will just continue with a couple more questions for whoever can stick around for a few more minutes. So just one second. Uh, also, another question I had was, what, how have, um, how important have other women been or men? Um, you know, each of you have discussed this a little bit, um, and how important have you maybe even been in someone else's journey? Um, so I want to speak on this just because I have a little bit different of an experience. Um, when I was at Disney, um, my supervisor's supervisor uh, left the company and a woman replaced him. Um, and at the time, I didn't really think any of it. It was like kind of a short stint there. I was really trying hard to prove myself. I was on like a very difficult team, um, but it ended up that she wasn't really supporting me um, and was kind of actually working against me. Um, she had a coworker of mine basically kind of start taking over my duties without really telling me. So she just kept like sending him over to meetings that I should have been in and asking him to look up things and do reports that I was assigned to do without directly telling me. Um, and so it got to the point where he himself, my coworker, and then my team that I was working with who was now being like given this new person to work with were getting very uncomfortable with it. Um, and they went to her and spoke to her about it. And she's like, oh yeah, she's off the project. He's supposed to be on it now. Um, and so it was really hard for me because um, I was young and new and kind of you know, at the bottom of the ladder anyway, trying to prove myself. And then to have what is not a great situation of being removed from a project and not being told why and it coming from a woman. And that was very, very tough on me. Um, and so what that actually did for me is it made me want to kind of not be that for someone else, right? Is that when I'm in her position or as I get older in my career and move up, I want to be that support because at the end of the day, it wasn't even that I was taken off of the project that was necessarily the problem. Um, there are people who are better me, there are people who are better suited for projects, that's fine. That's what happens in the workforce. It was the way in which she did it without really telling me and just especially coming from a woman that really hurt. And so I wanted to be sure that I didn't make anyone feel like that again. So really this whole empowered women, empower women thing was I was like, look at you, you're like a manager level woman and a big company like Disney, this is amazing. And yet I don't feel great for having been the person who worked under you. Um, so that definitely really called out the importance of that to me. And then kind of like I mentioned, like my CEO at my company is one of my like biggest advocates now. And he's like a 45 year old white male. And it's like, that, you know, so I think it's really important that, um, like we were saying, kind of like we make this space for people and really just advocate for people. Um, I think as women, we should try especially hard to, I feel like her mentality and the kind of mentality that I think I've seen some women have is kind of like, I have to do everything I can to stay here, which means I can't afford to help anyone else, which I feel like is the wrong mentality to have as opposed to all of us working together to build each other up really. Yeah, and that's very important to keep in mind, uh, we discussed this even in our last month's panel, that there are so many opportunities and you don't have to stifle someone else to keep your spot or, you know, your promotion or things like that. Like there's enough growth and enough opportunities for everyone to have a piece of the pie. And I think people don't see that all the time. And it's maybe not even a pie, right? It's just un unbounded growth that, out that actually does exist. So uh, I completely agree with that. Any other of you ladies have a important woman or man or you know what you have done to maybe transform someone else's life in ICS um well, I had um a young man that he was 19 that I knew and he he didn't know what he wanted to do he was going to community college and he got to see, you know, how I live and, you know, I saw my home office and knew what I did for a living. At one point he said, you know what, Casey, I thought about programming, but I thought that software engineers only worked in windowless basements. But now that I see how you live and 
you know, you've got a nice car and you've got a house and, oh, maybe I should give that an, another, you know, consider that again. And I, and I said, well, yeah, <laughs> first off, we're in California. There aren't that many windowless basements, <laughs> but secondly, TV isn't real. So uh, he's like, yeah, now that I think about that, you have a point. I said, you know, all of Silicon Valley isn't underground. Think about that. They Programmers work in normal office buildings with windows. And uh, he ended up getting into a computer science department at a school in Portland and now does front end work for Nike up there. So sometimes you got to overcome misperceptions from the media. I wasn't prepared for that one, but here we are. Yeah, that, that's a very funny, interesting story for sure. Um, so when we're talking about social media, you know, Casey, you brought that up. Has social media been, do you think, good or bad for, you know, a social cause and for showing diversity? Has it maybe been a hindrance to kind of say, hey, I think they just work in a basement and they don't get to see people or do you think because we have these platforms to speak out and now everyone has a voice, whether it's through Instagram or YouTube or blogs, that it has actually been better? Or, you know, maybe it's a little bit of both, I guess. Well, I think it's been better. Um, being able to show the diversity of the world and getting perspectives. Like on Twitter, you can follow anyone you want. On Instagram, you can see how people actually live and they actually work and um it's been great for me anyway to to see how the rest of the world lives uh, especially on on twitter not so much instagram because i'm not really on there that much but i know that others like being able to to see the visuals and how the rest of the world interacts with each other and get their perspectives so I think it's useful as long as you don't build a silo for yourself in like an echo chamber. You have to make sure that you're seeing things outside of your bubble. Anyone else would like to add a comment about that? Uh, I see there is a, uh, a hand raised by Adriana, so maybe we can give a space to yep. that. Adriana, do you want to make a comment? We cannot hear you. Maybe she was agreeing. <laughs> no, she's she's uh, talking, but we cannot hear her. We cannot hear you still. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes? OK. Sorry, my mic wasn't working. No, uh, first, thank you so much for, for having me. And thank you so much to all the panelists for sharing your stories. I just wanted to ask uh, very quickly, like uh, a different situation. Uh, for instance, let's say we know people um, in a position of power and we detect that this person has a good attitude towards supporting women um, and minorities in general, but doesn't really know how to do that or um, how, how to help the community or, or um, women in tech or another minority group and and not uh, this person maybe just help us individually but it's not uh, contributing to to make a balance to diversity in general because maybe it doesn't know how to like how, what can we do to uh, kind of um, educate or or support them to help us That's a great question. So I'll open it up to the panelists before I make a comment, um, which I have some ideas. I, I think it, it could be um, helpful to to share like the things that that we do. I personally know Adriana that you do many things for the community to share in those because sometimes people are, are not aware that those like volunteering opportunities exist and and also what is behind behind that, right? Like, why are we doing that? Like, why do we need that? Uh, like helping students or or mentoring others, like first sharing all those opportunities that uh, we as women participate and share also the why that's behind, because in some cases that's not known by by others uh, and we can share how is this important and offer to to be involved, because if they have the willingness to to help and, and to listen and, and to, to learn more, uh, inviting them. And I, I have been 
uh, very grateful to, 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 to men who have been like not only mentors, but also sponsors who had open doors for us. And they look for, for learning because like it's sometimes not uh, information that is easily available by their circle. So we can create again that awareness uh, and helping them to help us because sometimes we have uh, knowledge on, on that, how, how they can help us. It's not easy to articulate sometimes, but uh, I think it helps to have those conversations and, and be willing to openly answer the questions that they have. Thank you. So I, I'd like to add a comment. I think there's a variety of different ways to get involved, um, especially if you know pay. If you're not looking to even get paid for these contributions. I think if you're part of a different organization, so for example, your workplace, maybe you're a, an alumni of a school or a program, and then of course there's also local resources based on the city you're living in or a community you're living in. So I think those are places to start. Like for example, UCI has a mentorship program through the Ant Net community, reaching out to your alumni, your school, because they're always looking for help. So you can start at that level. And then when you're at a corporation, again, I'm sure Google has employee service groups and every company has different service groups. And HR is a great place to start if you don't know what your company has. And many other times it's like, you can create it, right? You can create a network. And I think that is what the power of the internet and technology is, is that, hey, you can just sign up with a little WhatsApp group of people that you're friends with to create change. And, uh, you know, actually this alumni chapter was formed and most of the people are people that I went to school with. And a handful of the panelists are also people I went to school with. And I just reached out and I was like, hey, can you, come be on this panel. Hey, can we have lunch? And let's go, you know, we have our panel, our, our board member, Jen, she's very passionate about um, social causes and helping um, the needy. And so she'll be like, hey, let's do a charity event. And so she'll just set up a group and then ask her friends to do that. So I think it's, there's no one specific answer. It's just very different um, communities that do exist and getting involved in ones that maybe already exist and or creating them. And it can start small and then you can tap into other resources is what I would say. And, but yeah, sometimes it is overwhelming. There's so many <laughs> resources. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, you know, it's almost 120. We've gone over quite a bit. Um, so I just wanted to end this and I really wanted to say thank you so much to our panelists. Um, I know a few of you had to sign off and I wanted to thank our audience again for making and uh, making time to join and seeing this special format and opening up this conversation about diversity and equality. So see you next month uh, for our scheduled uh, monthly lunch and learns. And we'll probably go back to a little more of our regular formatting. If anyone has some final thoughts, please free, feel free to share. And until then, otherwise we'll see you next week. Any, any final thoughts, please go ahead. The platform is open. Go ahead, Casey. Oh, you're saying bye? Yeah, just thank you for having me. It was nice to meet you all. Yeah. Thank you all. All right, have a great so much to be here. Let's Thank go empower women. Yes, empower. Great to see some familiar faces too.